go ahead and get started. Thank you, Justine, and also welcome everyone. And um, on behalf of the San Diego History Center, thank you very much for joining us. And also I would like to acknowledge our members and donors. And Justine is absolutely correct that we wouldn't be able to do this without your support. I'm now uh, for the next hour taking off my San Diego History Center CEO hat, much to the relief of uh, some of the staff, I'm sure, but um, and going to be sharing some of, of my stories about um, my favorite desert community, which is Marico Springs. So uh, first, I want to orient all of us to where we were talking about. So. At the top of your at the top left of your screen should be Los Angeles, San Diego, you see at the bottom on the coastal side. But if we go inland, almost to the Salton Sea, we're talking about the community that is uh, in the Borrego Valley, which is the, uh, surrounded by the Anza Borrego Desert State Park. So um, this area, the Borrego Valley, is the, um, the land that was uh, utilized by the first peoples of this area. Both the Kawea and the Kumeyaay have used this since time immemorial. 1775, Juan Bautista de Anza uh, led an expedition through the Brago Valley um, heading north to San Francisco to start a um, mission there. In the 1850s, uh, uh, Californians and homesteaders started coming to the Borrego Valley. And there was also, uh, the valley was used for cattle ranching for a period of time. And then in the 1900s and early 1900s, um, agriculture started to become um, a, a major employer and uh, industry in the valley. Um, Borrego Springs today is a very quiet community for the most part. Um, in the summer months, it can be extremely hot. In the winter months, it can be extremely cold, it is extremely dry, and then it is also extremely wet. So it is really a community of contrasts. Um, everyone thinks that the desert is only hot or only um, brilliant sun. That's generally true, but it also means that um, we have some others as well. Uh, this photo is uh, from uh, downtown Borrego in Christmas Circle. So when we talk about mid-century modern architecture, it's really the architecture or interior and product design uh, form that describes the mid 20th century developments generally from 1933 through 1965. I define Borrego Modern as the desert architectural design form of the mid 20th century, generally from 1949 through 1980. And I will talk a little bit about why that is the case. Now, I only have one photo in this presentation that is not from Borrego Springs, and this is it. This is Julia Schulman's Kaufman House, um, and the, it was by architect Richard Neutra. It's in Palm Springs, and Palm Springs is, is considered by most modernists as the mecca for mid-century modern, and there's a reason for that, is uh, because Palm Springs is to Los Angeles with Borrego, Borrego Springs is to San Diego. Um, when we talk about mid-century modern architecture and design, what we're talking about is um, this desire of local architects, designers, and builders to adapt materials, techniques, and floor plans to the unique uh, requirements and then also the opportunities of desert living. Most of this came out of technology that was part of World War II. So this includes large expanses of floor to ceiling glass, um, it includes flowing interior floor plans that merge the outdoors with the indoors. Mid-century modern uh, desert homes are oftentimes oriented to the rears of the property to take advantage of, um, of views and also pool. Uh, front elevations are shielded for privacy um, and include clear story and obscured glass panels to allow light to come in. Desert modern houses appear light with roofs that float, and the exterior materials can often include glass, stucco, wood, slump stone, and natural rock. There's a great story, and I'll be very brief about this photo. Julia Schulman uh, probably created the iconic uh, mid-century modern photograph with the Kaufman house. And Julius, before he passed away, I was fortunate to be able to hear um, 
you know, some of the challenges in taking this photo, he was attempting to capture the sunset that was happening in Palm Springs as the, um, as the light was changing. And the pool light was actually causing him lots of problems. So he had Mrs. Kaufman sit down to block it. And that's what has happened today. The rest of the photos that you are going to be seeing are all local of Borrego Springs and are all by local uh, photographers as well. So the period of time that we're gonna be talking about is the modern period of Borrego Springs, which is really from 1945 uh, forward. And the San Diego Union Tribune, or the San Diego Union at that time, reported that Alphonse A. Bernan Jr., major landowner and investor, was ambitious to create a San Diego County rival of Palm Springs. So Borrego has this rivalry and this desire that um, is very similar to what happens with San Diego and Los Angeles. So here is a, a sketch of the proposed Borrego Valley Country Club from 1945. And actually this is done by William Templeton Johnson. Um, many of you San Diego History Center members will recognize the name of William Templeton Johnson. He, William Templeton Johnson was the designer of the Sarah Museum in Presidio Park, the San Diego History Center's historic home. This was never developed or never built. And there are, this is gonna be a refrain in stories that we, you hear throughout this talk. But um, this was proposed uh, as a streamlined modern style resort. It's definitely different than the Sarah Museum. And William Templeton Johnson is an, a San Diego master architect, also did the San Diego Trust and Savings Building. So in 45, um, Bernand talks about creating the modern community of Borrego Springs, the resort community of Borrego Springs, but it's not until 1949 that it actually happens and starts. And that is because of World War II and the shortage of materials. So in 1949, we have William, uh, William Templeton Johnson that was proposed in 45, but in 1949, William Kessling, a developer first from Los Angeles who comes to San Diego, who has a practice in La Jolla, is hired by Bernand to do two buildings in Borrego Springs. First of this is the Desert Club, which replaces the William Templeton design and Borrego Business Building. So I have been fortunate in doing the research that so many people have opened their doors their physical doors of their houses, as well as their own personal archives. So this is a photo um, that is uh, from Patrick Pascal, who actually wrote the book on William Kessling and his designs. But this is a photo from the Kessling period of uh, the, the, uh, the Desert Club being constructed. And here it is as well. And if you'll notice that the building is actually secondary to the pool that's being there because they figured that the, at least if they have a pool, they can have a place where people can play. Now, the idea behind the Desert Club was that it was to be a country club. It's a, it was a dry course, but a place where prospective home owners could come. They would become part when you buy your parcel and then also would then promote development in the community. Something to note as well is that Borrego, which we currently spell B-O-R-R-E-G-O -R -R -E today with two R's, was in the old Borrego actually spelled with one R. So we haven't yet uh, transitioned Borrego from the old spelling to the new spelling in this uh, from Kessling Modern Structures. So this is the building actually after it was completed in 1949, Life Magazine sent a photographer down from Los Angeles to cover the actual um, event. This is the dry course, it was a nine a hole, it um, was terrible to play. Here is the uh, luau that was held at, at the time, they brought in big name entertainment at that time, Hilo Hattie, who was a, um, a Hawaiian entertainer came. Everybody sat around the pool, they ate pig, and then of course, afterward having too many cocktails, they wound up into the pool as well. Um, the Borrego Springs Desert Club actually lasted for almost 30 years. Um, you'll see here a promotional brochure for it and why, you know, facts about Borrego Springs and why not stay forever. But the, um, the, Borrego Desert Club actually started falling on hard times. 
and was ultimately sold um, to a couple who operated it for many, many years, almost about two decades, as a gallery, um, an art gallery, a kind of a community center, and then also as an antique mall. Uh, during the period of time that it was a, a community center, it hosted dances, it hosted uh, dinners as well. But this, it, it really started to fall on hard times. And in 2005, the Galleria, as it was then known, uh, uh, the, the owners, the Sheppies passed away and there it became available for um, purchase. So in 2005, uh, uh, John Scranton and his wife, who was a, an author, Lisa Fugard at that time, uh, purchased the Galleria and it was a mess and it was full of stuff. And uh, I could say for yet another uh, period, uh, a lecture, and I probably have about 10 of these in me, uh, the story, the backstory on the transition of the Desert Club from the Galleria to ultimately what it is today. Um, in 2009, uh, the, the John uh, placed the Desert Club up for sale. Uh, he had made a significant investment in it, and but wanted to move on and do other things. In 2009, it was purchased uh, by the University of California at Irvine and the Regents uh, through a very generous gift by Audrey Steele Bernand. And she is a, she was, she is no longer with us, but a relative of, the, of um, Alphonse A. Bernand by marriage. And she um, gave the university a gift of over $600,000 to purchase this property because it was so important to the community and it had such history in the community. Um, this is the pool um, at the time it was sold. And I wanna harken back just for a moment to when it first opened, there was a fashion show that was done at the Desert Club uh, as part of the festivities. Um, in 2008, uh, Versace chose uh, Borrego Springs and the Desert Club for uh, it's photo shoot, and this is Giselle Bunchen, who is the wife of Tom Brady, uh, uh, showing off Versace jeans there. Um, as I, I mentioned that it was sold to uh, the University of California, Irvine. It is now known today as the Audrey Steele Bernand University of California, Irvine Desert Research Center. And that is a mouthful, but the university undertook a major uh, renovation of the property. They originally had plans to change it um, through some preservation effort um, and some discussions with the university. They actually did a very nice restoration on it. On it. Here is some of the artwork in the building that uh, was from the, when it first opened. That is a, a mural of the De Anza expedition. You can see during the restoration process that on the left-hand side, as they started removing some of the um, additions that had been made over the years, that um, you can see the mule pack there. And on the left of the screen is the 1949 of the mule pack. A little bit on the right-hand side is what you could see it. Unfortunately, the uh, university was not able to restore the mural. It, um, one of their contractors inadvertently uh, painted over it. Today, this is what the main building looks very much like. It now has a huge wing on the back of it, but it's, um, it, this has been preserved as a community resource. And it's really gratifying to see the community utilize it in such a way. The other major building that William Kessling designed in 1949 was the Borrego Business Building. And this is the first commercial building. Uh, you can't have a successful town without businesses. And this was also, um, something that Kessling did and another great success story in the community. Um, it operated for many, many years as the Hugh, Hugh Woods Food Market. In um, about 2005, it was purchased by the then owner of Rams Hill and also La Casa del Zorro Resort, which many people will recognize in San Diego. But, um, and then really was, uh, uh, left vacant for almost a full decade. I think it was probably a full decade. And then um, local businessmen, philanthropist, San Diego History Center member, Jim and Ann Wormers um, uh, purchased the building 
and decided to do something quite radical with it. They in, were investing in the art community by creating uh, and restoring this building to become the Borrego Art Institute, what it is today. I first met um, Richard Orn, who was the architect for this project, by doing some research on Richard Serby, who is a Borrego Springs architect that I'll talk a little bit about later. And one of the things that you're gonna find about me is I'm thrilled and I get excited about architectural plans. We didn't know that these existed. This was, these are the original architectural plans for the Borrego Business Building by William Kessling. I found these in the archive of Richard Serby, who is the architect who in the night later after this was about, uh, built, probably in the mid to late 1950s, actually did a renovation for it to increase the size of it. Um, when restoring buildings, historic buildings, um, having the original plans is, is critical. And I was obnoxious. I walked into the building as the construction was happening and I met with Jim Wormers and Richard Oren and um, told them and shared with them this find that I had because I was very excited about it. And actually Richard says it changed the course of the restoration work that they were doing. Um, they took it down, they took the building down to the studs it needed to, it was in very bad shape. But this, the um, renovation and the restoration that has been done is phenomenal. And it's reopened today as the Borrego Art Institute, a nonprofit um, art institute in the Borrego Springs community. It also has a, a corresponding restaurant that is part of it that has in the past, um, the revenue of the restaurant has gone to help support the Art Institute and it's Kessling's Kitchen. It's one of the great places uh, to get a meal in Borrego Springs. And it's absolutely phenomenal to see the work that has happened there. I wanna give you a quick tour down Palm Canyon Drive, which is I call Borrego's main street. And we're gonna start our, our journey at Christmas Circle. And Borrego, contemporary Borrego Springs is laid out um, in the heart of the community is Christmas Circle. Um, and it was part of the plan from 1949. Borrego, uh, Palm Canyon Drive is that big east-west corridor that you see um, going to the top of the screen. And uh, that, and then you have the commercial core on both sides of that. This photo was taken probably in about 2013 or 14 during Borrego Days, which is held at the end of October, which is sort of the opening of the community. and. Um, at the time when you gave a donation of blood to the San Diego Blood Bank, uh, you got a helicopter ride as part of that. Christmas Circle has changed over the years. Um, uh, back in the early 60s, A. A. Bernand, Alphonse A. Bernand, one of the major investors and landowners of the community, created a fountain in the center. Um, even though we talk about Borrego Springs as being a desert and water is an issue, uh, there was always the boosterism that water was uh, an infinite source in the Borrego Valley. We know today that that's not the case, but A.A. Bernand created this um, fountain uh, for his, to honor uh, Joseph um, DiGiorgio. Uh, who was, the, the Georgios also play an important role in the agriculture and the development of the Borrego Valley. The, the fountain was actually removed in the 1980s um, because it was being vandalized by uh, folks and um, it was taken out. One of the questions I have for the community is where is that uh, sculpture today? It'd be interesting to find that out. So much of the, the the development that happens in Borrego Springs is in the early 1960s. So we have three, uh, two, excuse me, two major shopping centers that are um, done by Dick Zerbe, Richard Zerbe, uh, the Hacienda del Sol and the El Patio Shopping Center. Hacienda del Sol is one of the first uh, uh, places that you could get a room in Borrego Springs, also the Desert Lodge, which becomes La Casa del Zorro today. Um, and it's very much the, the renovations that Dick Zerby did on it are very much in a, a mid-century modern style. If you look at the overhang, the floating roof, the uh, exposed eaves there, that's very much mid-century modern uh, architectural design. 
We also have El Patio, or what was El Patio Retail Stores, that this building, these buildings are still there. Uh, Carlson Corey Realty is being uh, used today as Roadrunner Realty. Um, we also have um, uh, shops in, in that space, but I always love to find these uh, historic images or these period images that give us an idea of what was going on. These images are actually part of the Big Sur Beef Archive as well. Uh, in 65, a major development happens in the Valley, which is the Borrego Springs Mall and Villas Borrego condominiums. This is by Dick Zerby, along with uh, uh, Ray a Eggers and Joe Biscotti, who are um, uh, La Mesa architects and East County San Diego architects. One of the things that uh, you'll see is that there are a lot of architects and builders that do business in San Diego that are also doing business in uh, Borrego Springs. So. Thanks to the beautiful work and photography of Judy Parker, you'll see that we have um, block screening, which is also a, 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 a large defining feature of mid-century modern architecture. The um, mall is actually done in slump stone, and I love those benches that are there. We have um, Palm Canyon Drive. We have the post office chamber building. This is by Jim Burns out of Pasadena. And um, anywhere I can find photos or pictures or um, images, either in newspapers, I always like to include these. And so you're gonna be seeing a lot of these in here. This is a building that is done by uh, Hal Martinet. It looks like it's spelled Martinez, but it's uh, actually pronounced Martin A as part of it. And um, we're gonna see a change that happens in the Borrego Valley from the development team through Baker Marlowe and um, DiGiorgio and Bernand, and we'll see some San Diegans that come into the picture as well. This is the Anza Borrego Desert Natural History Center um, now owns this building and uses this as a, their offices, education center, and their store. One of my favorite places in Borrego Springs, and there's a great story behind this, is the Borrego Palms Resort, or the Palms uh, Indian Head, as it's known today. This was originally Hoburg's Resort, and in 1958, it burned to the ground. Uh, there was a fire uh, in the salon from one of the water heaters, and the Borrego Sun newspaper talks about the uh, blaze being, uh, being able to be seen through throughout the valley. And it was rebuilt and reopened, but there's a great mystery in the community is um, regardless, of, we don't know who the architect is of this structure. Um, there are some theories, but all of them have not been proven. And I tend to ignore theories unless I'm able to find some good um, uh, information that uh, supports those theories of, of who did the work. So beautiful staircase inside the um, palms that Indian had. This is st still a place that you can go to, you can check into the, um, the red, uh, not the Red Ocotillo, but the um, Coyote Cafe is here. The present owners of this have um, really done a wonderful job at uh, attempting to keep the mid-century feel and the vibe. And if it, when you go into the place, uh, quite a few celebrities uh, from Hollywood have come down to Borrego Springs, and they, many of them stayed in this place. Borrego Springs Park in 1963 um, is the work of Henry Hester and Robert Jones. Henry Hester is a modernist um, architect based here in San Diego. Um, if you walk across the bridge, the Korea Bridge from Babylon Park to Sixth Avenue, the Solomon Apartments are the work of Henry Hester. This is um, a project that is very different from many of, of his others, but it is um, a critical piece of um, Borrego architectural mid-century uh, history. Um, it is where um, the Arches restaurant is located. The golf course has been fallowed. The golf course is now um, not in, in use. The restaurant and the um, build and the club has been up for sale a couple of times. It's owned by an out-of-state um, real estate company, but it retains much of its um, integrity. And there's a great story about this building that we don't have uh, a lot of time to be able to talk about. So uh, hopefully 
Justine will have me back and we can do another one of these. I wanna spend a few minutes as well talking about De Anza Desert Club or the De Anza Desert Country Club, um, which covers a period of really development from 53 to 55. And in the development of Borrego Springs, it is uh, really the catalyst that leads uh, to ultimately the development that we have uh, today. I had mentioned the Desert Club previously, and it was a dry course. The Desert Club was ultimately not successful. De Anza Desert Country Club today remains a private uh, club and is something that continues the uh, business today. Um, it was touted to be the finest desert resort in the nation. And it marks a critical component in the change of investment that happens in Borrego Springs with um, Baker and Marlowe leaving uh, Bernand in the development of downtown Borrego Springs and in development. And uh, Bernand adds um, Robert DiGiorgio who brings land that was largely used for agriculture to become development. James Copley, who as becomes the owner and buys the Desert Lodge, which becomes La Casa del Zorro. And James Copley with his publishing empire, including the San Diego Union, and ultimately the Tri Tribune, um, brings um, and focuses worldwide attention through his newspapers on the Borrego Valley. And William Black, if you are new to San Diego, you uh, probably have heard about Black's Beach above La Jolla. That is the beach that was owned by William H. Black, who um, made his money in Texas oil. Um, so when you look at the success of Palm Springs, the, it is clear that uh, country clubs and death and golf are part of the secrets to that success. And so that's what Bernand wanted to model here in, um, in Borrego Springs. And actually what Bernand did was he hired initially the same people who did perhaps the most famous and initially um, successful golf course in um, Palm Springs, which is the Thunderbird. And so uh, there are initially um, Bernand hires Lawrence Hughes to design the course, initially a nine hole course that expands to 18 holes and then William Cody to do the architectural design. So I love this photo because it is uh, so optimistic and so unrealistic all at the same time. This um, is from the San Diego History Center collection. It's part of the Union Tribune archive. The Borrego Sun, Sun was owned by uh, James Copley and when 1981, when the San Diego Union gave um, its uh, photo archive to the San Diego Union, uh, to the San Diego History Center, we got some of the photos of the Borrego Sun as part of this. So this is Mrs. Hal Martinet, Mrs. Bud Kurtz, and A.A. A. Bernand and um, Mrs. Kurtz uh, celebrating the completion of the first well at De Anza Desert Country Club. And it's, and it's called, the caption is New River. And um, it really talks about the promise of unlimited water for the Borrego Valley. We know today that Brago Valley is served by only one aquifer. It is an overdraft and it is in, it's a limited resource. So um, this really speaks to a different age and a different design aesthetic. Okay, apologies for plans, but I love them. And when I'm able to go to the uh, UC Santa Barbara or to Cal, in this case, Cal Poly to look at archives, the William Cody archive is at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I get really excited to see the projects that were proposed and in some cases projects developed, but in other cases like this one, the project never happened. And it is a wild design for the country club and the um, housing that would have been going around it. And I, part of me, uh, really wishes that um, Kurtz and Bernand um, had invested and continued the plans of William uh, Cody in that. Um, Cody ultimately um, is not chosen to do the designs and Richard Zerbe is, designed, is chosen. The first clubhouse is actually um, designed by builder um, Hal Martinet 
um, and it uh, com was completed in time for the formal opening. It looks slightly like the um, William Cody design, but not nearly as elegant or um, as complete. So part of the my process was doing, um, and I was fortunate to be able to do oral histories with some of the uh, Borrego pioneers that were around at this time. And, and Beverly Kurtz, who was the wife of Bud Kurtz, um, the widow of Bud Kurtz, I asked her, well, how come this was, you, you guys didn't, use the William Cody plans. And why did you ultimately end up going with Dick Zerby to do it? And she said, well, it ultimately would come down to money. Uh, William Cody wanted a lot of money for his designs and his plans, even though we had, they had gone through a process of, of doing that. Um, and they felt that they could be uh, conserve funds and do more with Richard Zerby. I happen to love Dick Zerby and there's a, um, my story about finding Dick Zerby largely centers around the San Diego History Center and the research I did uh, a, around what ultimately becomes um, my quest to understand Borrego modern architecture, which based is, is based on in 2000, uh, Suzanne and I did the crazy thing and we actually purchased a house at uh, the Anza Country Club, uh, Fairway Cottage, and my, idea was, I really like this architecture, I really like this design, but who in the world uh, designed it? Come to find it out and through a series of um, really um, wonderful introductions that it was designed by Richard Serby, who came to California as a teenager. He loved planes. He went to work during World War II with Convict at Convict, uh, Consolidated Vaulty, which was the predecessor to Convair. And Dick um, was a quintessential um, kind of, uh, what do you call the term? What's the term for uh, somebody that's good at all things, uh, good at all trades. So he was a self-taught builder. He uh, studied aeronautical engineering. He was a horseman. Um, he was a um, somebody that studied and, and became a licensed architect all on his own. Um, I love this photo because it, it, he always wore kind of a trademark hat. Um, later on in life, he would become um, a preservationist and he and his wife uh, settled and raised their children in Julian and um, the family still is located in Julian. And he is on this horse here. Um, the caption on the horse is, uh, it's actually backwards because the bridle's on the wrong side, but the, the, the horse was a great ride, a lot of, uh, full of piss and vinegar. Um, so this is the fairway cottage plans. Again, I found these in Dick Serby's archive um, and it's, oh my gosh, what in the world do we have here? But it's, it is a, a, a blueprint for what his ideas about um, desert living would be, again, very much about um, uh, blurring the lines between the indoors and outdoors. You have a fireplace that is central. If you look on the upper right-hand side, it, you have clear story windows. This is a, a 1961 photograph of um, one of the units. This is not the one that Suzanne and I ultimately purchased, but um, in the same vintage, if you look at the beams that are along the top, those uh, hearken to um, uh, the, the ribs of a plane, uh, an old style plane. This is our house. It's been on a couple of tours. Um, it, it's undergone some, uh, some significant renovations. It's a work in progress, um, but we really um, enjoy it and um, like it. Uh, we purchased our furniture is not uh, at Palm Springs Modern uh, Festival and or Modernism Weekend. And you always wanna be careful going to those types of shows. But um, it's really about a form of living, about uh, integrating the indoors and out. Uh, and speaking of the outdoors, the common areas surround it, the, the, the cottages are four um, individually owned units that share a common uh, pool. And a pool is absolutely necessary in the desert. And what's great about sharing a pool is that one homeowner doesn't necessarily have to do the upkeep on it. Um, so these are period photos. Again, 
like from 1961, they're um, rare. Another Dick Zerbe work is the Satch Residence at De Anza Desert Club. Um, this has been in the same family for three generations now. Um, it's unusual design. It's the Satch Residence known uh, historically, but it has this barrel shaped roof and an indoor pool, which is it seems um, perhaps counterintuitive, but in the desert in the summertime, the shade apps actually helps cool the pool and it also protects the pool from all of the wind that happens in the desert. Okay, we're gonna move away from Dick Zerby for a little bit. We're gonna talk about, again, Henry Hester, modernist uh, here in San Diego, the Givler residence. Um, this is perhaps one of the most spectacular houses at the Enza Desert Club. Um, it is to me on par with the Richard Neutra design. Um, and there's a great story. Um, it's kept in, it, it fell out of the family. Uh, Trace Wilson, who was a La Jolla architect, um, it, it's actually his family's house. He bought it back. Um, the, the sketch was done between his uh, grandfather and uh, Henry Hester over cocktails at the La Casa del Zorro bar. And it is beautifully furnished today. It is. Um, sits on the golf course. It does not have a pool, which is unusual, but it has the green of the golf courses acting as its um, area. Um, also at De Anza, and I kind of consider De Anza and De, An De Anza Country Club and De Anza Drive as our um, mo modern mile of uh, architecture is the DiGiorgio residence, 1958. Um, and this is by a work that I had, uh, architect I had never heard of before, which is Leo Raffaelli. Um, who did several projects for the DiGiorgio for the company. Um, initially, and this is a good example of how uh, history, as we do more research, we learn more. Um, this project was initially identified by a, a Borrego Sun article as being the work of William Cody. And I in incorrectly attributed it. But in looking through the History Center archive and the photo archives particularly, found the uncropped photo and found Leo Raffaelli architect on it. Um, it is a, a spectacular property. This rock wall pierces the building uh, facade and goes inside and um, is part of the fireplace as well. William Kreisel, known um, as one of the premier architects uh, in Palm Springs, actually comes to San Diego and Borrego Springs and creates um, uh, the Borrego Golf Club Annex. Six um, houses that are built at the time cost $20,500. Um, one of them just sold that had been uh, extensively renovated for what was it, I think, over the neighborhood of 300, high 300 thousands. Uh, highly prized, this one won a um, Soho People and Preservation Award for its um, sensitive restoration by uh, Todd Pittman and Carmen Pauly. Um, when we talk about San Diego architects and particularly architects who divine, define a genre, Cliff May is at that top of that list who is credited with being the father of the modern ranch house. And there are three projects in Borrego Springs, two that were built, one that never was. The, the 1948 Montgomery residence that you're seeing um, renderings for here was never built. And there's uh, actually, uh, Montgomery uh, takes off and stiffs Cliff May, and there's correspondence in the file about Cliff May trying to get um, his money out of Montgomery, um, and it never does. 1949, this project is, um, is built, and it's actually featured in um, a national magazine as the, the, the ideal of desert living. This is the, uh, the, the, the last project that Cliff May did in uh, Borrego Springs, it's the Daniels residence. And Harry Daniels was the founder of the Anza Borrego Desert Natural History Association. And the current owners of it have done an amazing job of restoring it and preserving it. Um, it's the last project, or one of the last projects that Cliff May designed. And Cliff May spent sp significant time with the Daniels, specifically um, uh, researching the lot. And Harry Daniels um, wrote Sunset Magazine. 
and said, would you provide, what, do you dare provide or would you provide an introduction to me to Cliff May? And actually the Mays and um, the Daniels became fast friends. And uh, again, spec this spectacular desert um, views, but it's very much a Cliff May design. We're uh, moving forward in time and I know we're getting close on our, our time period to want to wrap up and I'm going to try and do that in the next five minutes, but we've got the McGuire residence, which is Sim Bruce Richards. Um, if you're not familiar with Sim Bruce Richards, Keith York of modern uh, San Diego is going to actually be doing and is working on a re uh, an exhibition that will be opening, we hope in February of next year on Sim Bruce Richards, but this is a very different uh, Sim Bruce Richards project. Um, it's the only project, or actually I think there are two projects in Borrego that Sim Bruce Richards did, but this one is a private residence um, and um, for, the, for the McGuire's. And again, it reflects uh, uh, very much the owners. Um, Sim Bruce Richards did not do a lot of Adobe work. This was actually built by the Weir brothers. Again, um, plans I get excited about. The owner, the present owners, have the plans, and we actually have, I believe, a copy of our of the plans in our archive. 1980, something happens in Borrego Springs, and there is a development that takes place that's known as Rams Hill. And it is done, it's a DiGiorgio development, and it um, moves modern, or moves the architecture in a different direction. But not everybody is following the Santa Fe uh, ethos that um, happens at uh, Rams Hill. Maury McKenzie is a self, um, he started, it was a student of architecture. He went to in, in World War II and then managed his family's printing business, but always loved the idea of architecture and design. And so designed his own home at the coast um, and then also here at um, De Anza Desert Club. Um, very much in a, a mid-century modern style. Uh, blank, it, it doesn't open itself to the street. This is the street view. But when you go inside the gate, there's the pool, there's this wonderful walls of glass that, that blur the line between indoors and outdoors. And Judy did a really a phenomenal job in photography in the um, black and white and color uh, interiors here. Um, the owners of this house have, have been meticulous with its restoration. Um, it opens up to the golf course and is again, just a spectacular space. The um, next development uh, is the Chambers Dax residence. And while we're moving uh, forward in time and we're becoming contemporary, mid-century modern design continues to have an influence on current constructions. This is the work of Walt uh, Chambers. Um, again, it, it presents a very stark face to the street, but when it, it opens itself up from the desert and uh, again, the walls of glass, clear stories, outside in pools, um, really a celebration of this idea of connecting with nature. And it is a spectacular spot. This is probably one of my favorite houses and one of the more radical constructions in Borrego Springs. It is the work by Richard Orne, um, the same architect who worked on uh, the restoration of the um, and creation of the Borrego Art Institute, the, Ke the, the Kessling Business Building in downtown on Christmas Circle. In 2012, Richard and his partner, Susan Hancock, created what is um, a design that will blow your mind when you see it. It is uh, somewhat, um, it is very contemporary, but again, has a mid-century ethos of walls of glass. It is partially built off-site and brought on-site with um, steel frame construction, concrete and, and footings done on-site, um, and then uh, you know elements that are trucked on to the place. This is a spectacular project and property. It also has been featured in uh, national magazines and um, has the most extensive um, uh, views of the desert. Some people actually find it unsettling being in this space. The final uh, 
final place I want to highlight is the Borrego Springs Library in Borrego Springs Park, which is a real recent um, pre-pandemic completion by Rosling Nakamura Terrata Architects San Diego office. And um, this was going to be a Santa Fe building originally. And members of the community and the community library and the county fortunately listened to the community and uh, they really created a spectacular uh, architectural uh, landmark now. It's a $13 million project and it's, you might think that that is uh, an extravagance for a community that has 3,500 year round resident or uh, year round residents and uh, an additional 10,000 that come in during this uh, season. But it really is a tremendous community resource. We talk about Borrego Springs being a difficult place to build and it's because it's a floodplain. And this uh, gives you an idea of just how high off the ground the library has been situated in order to be able to handle for flooding. But it is a spectacular space. And when you come to Brago, make sure you go and, and experience it because it really is an experience. So that concludes my talk. I wanna thank uh, you all for being part of this. Uh, I wanna thank Judy Parker for her um, spectacular photography. I had wonderful additional photography by um, those uh, photographers listed here. Something of this nature would not be possible without a lot of people giving me of their time, their talent, their treasure, uh, and opening their doors. By the way, don't just knock on somebody's door. They may uh, open it with a gun in your face. That hasn't happened. Borrego is a very um, uh, opening and welcoming community. Um, resources. Um, I would say the first thing to place the start is the San Diego History Center website. Go up, use the search bar, and say Borrego Springs, and that will put things back um, uh, out to you that will help. Also on our collections uh, site, collections.sandiegohistory.org, you can find some of those same photos that I have licensed as well. Uh, additional um, help was provided by the William Cody Archive at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and then also uh, the Cliff May Archive at the University of Art and Architecture Collection in UC Santa Barbara, and uh, you can reach me at bill at borregomodern.com. I should acknowledge that I am revealed, or not revealed, but um, disclose that I am a licensed realtor in the state of California, and I work for Caldwell Banker Borrego Springs, and I specialize in mid-century modern architecture. And that will do it for me. We're going to be hopefully take, have some time to take a few questions. And Justine, you're going to talk about what's up next for the San Diego 101 series. That is correct. So really quickly, uh, we will be hosting a special virtual presentation on October 26th with Dr. Rudy Guevara called Growing Up Mexipino. Um, I went ahead and put the link in the chat box if you are interested in registering, if you haven't already. Uh, once again, that's going to be Wednesday, October 26th from 4 to 5 p.m. And we are going to continue our SD 101 webinar series every second Tuesday of the month at 12 p.m., Please join us next month, November 15th, for SD 101, Changing the Narrative and Developing the Next Generation of Herstorians. Um, please look for our emails to be able to register for that event. Uh, you can also go to sandiegohistory.org and click the events tab to look for more upcoming events. Um, but we will go on, ahead and move on with any um, questions that you have. I see we have a few in the chat box. Um, Justine, I'd, I would like to add just with the, uh, Dr. Guevara's talk, that will not be recorded. So make sure that you actually plan to be here for that. So thank you. happy to take questions in the remaining time. And thank you everybody for letting me just rattle on for a long time. <laughs> All right, so our first question um, from Linda, were there any overlapping of architects in Palm Springs Modern and Borrego Springs? Yes, absolutely. William Cody um, is one. Um, there are a few that I, I, should, I should know, but um, they, they practiced, uh, William Cody is, uh, I, I'm sorry, William Cody and Bill Kessling. Bill Kessling is probably the, the most famous of all of them. And actually, it used to be that we would market those as um, Alexander Holmes. Uh, and my colleagues in the real estate industry would do that. And Bill Kreisel actually came to Borrego and Todd Pittman and I had a, a chance to meet with him. 
he said that he actually, um, no, these are original designs for Vertigo Springs. So don't market them as Alexander and Holmes. And um, I've always, uh, part of me is uh, boosterism around San Diego and uh, Borrego Springs. So I like to claim local whenever we can. So Bill Kreisel is a local architect. Thank you, Bill. Um, that was our only question in the chat box. So if you have a question, um, please put it in now while we still have a few more moments. We do have a comment um, about the house that did not have a pool reminded um, them of the entry to Frank Sinatra's house in Palm yes. Springs. Um, so any more questions? We have a thank you. Great presentation from Neil. Thank you, Neil. A few more moments. Thank you everyone for being part of this. Um, we understand it's a commitment out of your day and uh, we appreciate that. Again, I'm gonna put a put my San Diego History Center hat back on now and say, if you are not a member of the San Diego History Center, please consider joining. If you are already a member, please consider giving um, or do both actually. We are only able to do this based upon the support that we receive. Uh, thank you, Keith York. Um, by the way, go back and look at Keith York's Sim Bruce, uh, excuse me, um, not Sim Bruce Richards, uh, uh, Julia Schulman, uh, uh, modern San Diego, because it is a fantastic talk. And if you like beautiful photography, there is nothing better than the work that Julia Schulman has done. And Keith York is the, um, the, is the authority, uh, subject matter expert on all things modern San Diego. So Keith, I really appreciate that. Ann Wormers, it's wonderful to have you as part of it. And I uh, cannot thank you and Jim enough for all that you do for the Berea community. And uh, it's uh, phenomenal. We do have a question that just popped up. Um, question is, could you share more about the popularity of having partially obscured entrances? Yes, it's a matter of when you shut your door, you are in your space. And so um, it provides a level of privacy that sometimes we don't, if you think about life in the city, you know, we, and the traditional approach to um, let's say, residences and so we open ourselves to the street. Uh, there's something about cherishing time to yourself and it's a little bit different. Um, so uh, part, of the, part of the lure of I think desert living and also in some cases mid-century modern is that it is much about your own space. And um, so that's what we mean by presenting a blank, uh, blank face to the street or um, that type of thing. It, it's sort of walling yourself off and providing a level of privacy. Besides, you're going to be having friends over, and you're having cocktails, um, you know, those types of things. We, we should talk about the lifestyle at some point as well, because, um, you know, everything that you've seen in Mad Men and um, is somewhat, somewhat true, not necessarily to that extent, but that's part of the lure of um, mid-century modern. All right, and I believe that's it. We have a question about access to the slides. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the YouTube link back into um, the chat box. Um, we will be putting this up shortly. While we don't have access to the slides, you can definitely rewatch um, the video. Um, and if you're curious about any photos, of course, you can go to our website um, and use our photo archive to look for any pictures of Borrego Springs. Yes, um, that, that's a good question and that's a good point. Um, you know, the, the I, I should mention that I began this the process of doing this research in 2000 and um, just a, a, and while I'm willing to share it and I know Keith York is as well and Todd Pittman and any of us who um, do research, um, you know, we also appreciate the acknowledgement of the, that effort in this process as well. But all the, my, everything that um, I'm happy to share the resources. So um, if you go back and look at the YouTube video, you'll see my resources. All of those resources are generally available to the public. They many times do require appointments though. And in some cases you have to be somebody that's doing um, and get your research vetted before you 
actually go up and, and, and meet. Just as the San Diego History Center is, is accessible, but it's by appointment only and or our community research access days. So for, for me, I had to wait. We have one of the great, um, we have a great Borrego Springs archive is part of the San Diego History Center. And you wouldn't think of that necessarily as being the case, but we have the Borrego, um, an extensive collection of the Borrego Sun. And that was because Virginia Damaris, who was the editor of the Borrego Sun for a very long time, needed, decided that there needed to be a place where that um, archive was gonna live. It was the San Diego History Center. And it's here in Balboa Park. Um, at the time, I had to wait a year and a half before I was able to look at it because it was sent out to be microfilmed. And so I had to wait for that. I later found out that there was a beautiful, the bound set up sets of the Borrego Sun at the Borrego Springs High School. And I have another story about sitting in the high school uh, uh, cafeteria, around, which is their library as well. Um, and, a, and a bunch of students coming in going, what's that old man doing? And then I invited them over. I shared some of that, and they were like, "Wow, we never knew that about our our place where we're growing up." So, anyway. All right. I think that concludes our talk. Then, thank you, Bill, for sharing with us, um, and thank you so much for everybody who joined in. Thank you to our members, and thank you to our donors as well. And hopefully, we'll see you all next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Justine.